Today, we're going to be speaking with Stephen Levitsky, professor of government and director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies and also co-author with Daniel Ziblatt of Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point. Uh, I really appreciate your time and, and having you on. And there's so many historical things we could talk about and present day things that we could talk about related to this topic, maybe just to start and to contextualize the book a bit. What do you believe makes American democracy arguably fragile and maybe in an unprecedented way right now? A couple of things. First of all, I should point out that um, this nearly every social science theory that we have tells us that American democracy shouldn't be fragile. There are kind of two rock solid facts that social scientists have uncovered about democracies. First of all, rich democracies never die. No democracy uh, with a per capita GDP of more than about $17,000 in today's dollars has ever broken down. So the United States is four times wealthier than that. And secondly, old democracies never die. No democracy over the age of 50 has ever broken down. Even if we date the birth of US democracy at 1965 with the Voting Rights Act, the US is over 50. So it shouldn't be in trouble. Um, we argue there are two things going on. It's sort of a, uh, a, a cocktail of, of two factors that, that are explosive. One is the radicalization of the Republican Party. Uh, the Republican Party, it's very, very unusual for parties that are 150 years old that have been competing in elections peacefully for well over a century, radicalized to the point where they're no longer committed to democratic rules of the game, but that uh, unfortunately has happened in recent years. And secondly, a set of uh, excessively counter-majoritarian institutions that allow partisan minorities to systematically thwart and even at times govern over electoral majorities. And the combination of those two things, the, the a radicalized minority party and institutions that protect and empower that minority party is a particularly difficult combination. I, I want to talk about the term tyranny of the minority a little bit. Uh, yeah. I was it just so happened that Recently, I read one of Nassim Taleb's books in which he talks about an asymmetry that exists where in a maybe counterintuitive way, the minority controls the majority. He gives some kind of innocuous examples, like, for example, um, why is it that non GMO has become such a thing when a statistically small percentage of people care about it? And it's because there's this asymmetry where if you want non GMO, you only eat the non GMO food. If you don't care about that, you'll also eat the non GMO food. Same thing applies to like why are soft drinks all kosher when only a third of one percent of the country keeps kosher? Well, because if you don't care about kosher, you'll have those very same drinks and it can kind of give us an idea of how a minority can end up becoming uh, tyrannical for, for lack of a better term when it comes to this shift in the Republican Party that you're talking about. Are we seeing a minority view within that party dominate for some reason, or is this actually becoming the predominant perspective on democracy and elections and so many other things within the party? That is a great question. Um, first of all, it, I mean, you're absolutely right that there are many, many, many aspects of our society, of our economy, of our culture, where small numbers, where the, where the preferences of small numbers of people prevail. Um, we're not making claims about that. There are lots of reasons for that. It, it may be inevitable. It may not be. We're simply looking at political institutions and the effects of political institutions. And the reason we use tyranny in the title, which is overstated, yes. is to um, speak to the idea of tyranny of the majority, obviously, which was a concern of a number of political philosophers, uh, including former President John Adams, uh, and 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 which it is believed that our constitution was sort of founded, and it's only partly true, but founded with, uh, in light of the fear of the of tyranny of the, of the majority. And uh, the argument is that, um, perversely, paradoxically, institutions founded with a fear of tyranny of the of the of the majority are actually empowering a partisan minority. We can get into to that. But your question about the Republicans. 
Um, I I think it's fair to that uh, you know the the data are are both mixed and changing, so one can't make a really definitive statement. But I think it is probably fair to say that a minority of the Republican Party is controlling the fate of the party. It is a more ideologically committed minority. It is an activist minority. And most importantly, it is a primary winning plurality. Uh, it's enough to win primaries. And that's what, what prevails. We uh, I have very mixed views of, of primaries. I, I, I like primaries. I vote in primaries. I recognize that they're more democratic than what we had before. But primaries are very double-edged. Primaries are um, have the potential to select for more extreme candidates that are favored by relatively small groups within parties. It's only a very small minority of Democrats and Republicans that vote in primaries. And this right. hasn't always been the case, but in recent years, it's definitely been the case that the more sort of ethno-nationalist, radicalized, anti-system wing of the Republican Party, what we call MAGA, are much more likely to vote in primaries. And so a, a, a MAGA position, which is not a majority in the country, which may not be a majority in the Republican Party, is definitely enough to win primaries. And that's what counts. Can you talk a little bit about what you see as the role of populist rhetoric in this? And to contextualize this, as we talked about before we started the interview, I'm from Argentina and I followed Latin American politics relatively closely and have seen how populist rhetoric, which really is a rhetoric rather than a set of policy ideas. You can use populist right. rhetoric and then say what Tucker Carlson says, which is protect yourself from brown people and BLM who will take your house. You can use populist rhetoric and have what might be considered more left wing ideas. But that rhetoric has been used in many parts of Latin America. It was heavily present in Trump's 2016 run. What is the role of that in getting us to where we are today? I agree. Um, a pretty big role. As you as you point out, it's very important to note that populism is a strategy. It's a rhetoric. It's not a set of policies. It's not an ideology. It can take left wing forms. It can take right wing forms. It can often take ambiguous forms in the case of Bukele in El Salvador. Right. Um, in Latin America, it's more often, not always, but more often taken a more left wing form in the West, in the industrialized West. It tends to take a more ethno nationalist right wing form. But what populists, what populism has in common is it it's an appeal against the entire elite. It's an anti elite appeal. It tells voters that the entire political elite, all the parties, all the main politicians, the whole establishment is corrupt, is not thinking about you, the voter, is uh, is maybe conspiring against you, the people, towards some noxious end. Um, and that, again, that can take a right wing form, it can take a left wing form. In the West, in recent years, it's generally taken a form of an appeal to the to overstate it a little bit, the average white guy, uh, that that uh, the elite, and that includes everything from Harvard professors to journalists to Wall Street, yep. including the political parties, the elite is conspiring to take the country away from you. Uh, and that's a very powerful rhetoric, given the amount of social and cultural change that we've experienced in this country. A lot of MAGA voters feel like the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. And that's what populists are telling them. That's what Tucker Carlson tells them. That's what Trump tells them. So, yes, this is a populist appeal. Just to add one more thing, populism, as you noted, has been around for a long time, but it's a lot easier today. It's easier today because the establishment doesn't have the tools that it used to have to fight back. Because of primaries, because of social media, because of the decline of traditional media, it's much easier to be a populist today, to reach voters with a populist message than it was in the middle of the 20th century. We are in a more democratic moment today than we were in the middle of the 20th century when the establishment, when three television stations and leaders of two parties and a handful of interest groups could basically veto politicians. We're in a much more democratic moment today, but it, it's a moment that leaves us much more vulnerable to populist appeals. Donald Trump could not have done what he did in 2016 back in the early part of the 20th century or the middle right. part of the 20th century, only in the early 21st century. 
in uh, in my forthcoming book, which I've been researching and writing, I kind of chart a path that starts, as I tell it, with the Civil Rights Act and opposition to the Civil Rights Act from what are today's Republicans charting it through Reagan, 94 and Gingrich, et cetera, et cetera. That gets us to where we are today with the Republican Party that you describe historically. What are the sort of circumstances that tend to be in place when political parties turn against democracy? Are there common characteristics? I think so, but it's been it's hard to say. I mean, we we started writing our book and, and chapter four of Tyranny of the Minority takes on this very question. It sounds like it, it makes a, a somewhat similar answer to you, which is we, tr we take up the question of why would a mainstream conservative party that had been, uh, you know, competing peacefully in elections for for decades and decades and decades, suddenly go off the rails. Maybe not so suddenly, but go off the rails. Yeah. Bit, it turns out it's a really rare thing. It's hard to find demo parties that are born democratic that compete for decades as established mainstream political parties and then radicalize and turn against democracy. Maybe Chilean conservatives in the '60s and '70s. We point to the example of the Thai Democratic Party in the early 21st century. We had to go as far as Southeast Asia to find a good comparison. Another good comparison, I think, is the Democratic Party in the U.S. South in Reconstruction. Mm. Um, it, their, the response to Reconstruction was, was a, a sort of violent and authoritarian turn. But there are not many cases of it, so it's hard to generalize. Our argument, or my argument is, Part, political parties are likely to accept the results of elections played by democratic rules under two conditions. One, they believe they'll be able to compete again in the future. And two, they believe that losing will not bring catastrophic consequences. Mm. When political parties or their constituents feel like either they're not going to be able to win again, or maybe more importantly, that losing will bring catastrophe, that losing poses an existential threat, Right. That's when parties are likely to turn against democracy. And so our view is that the Republican transformation is kind of a two step process. In the late 20th century, the party, the Republicans were a, a minority party in the New Deal era looking for looking for ways to build up a majority legitimately. That's what parties do. In the middle of the civil rights movement, they realized that the South and that broadly speaking, racially conservative white voters were available as the Democratic Party slowly embraced civil rights, especially in 64, 65. The Republicans saw a constituency that they could appeal to. Goldwater did it. Nixon did it. Reagan did it. He added uh, evangelical Christians to coalition. So whereas racially conservative voters used to be evenly distributed between the two parties, maybe slightly more concentrated in the Democratic Party, over the course of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, Republican leaders shepherded racially conservative whites, especially in the South, from the Democratic Party into the Republican fold. So by the turn of the century, most racially conservative whites are now located in the Republican Party, particularly in the South. The South goes right. from being overwhelmingly, the white South goes from being overwhelmingly Democratic to being overwhelmingly Republican. And then in the 21st century, we start to feel the effects of immigration and the civil rights revolution. And so we begin to really feel the effects of America's very long, slow transition to multiracial democracy. That racially conservative base radicalizes. And that, uh, but, it, but because of the work the party did in the 20th century, it, these guys are all concentrated in the Republican Party, or mostly concentrated in the Republican Party, enough, again, to win primaries. Trump is the first guy who really, really grasped that. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left. I want to introduce one other thing at the risk of it being too simplistic. To some degree, this has happened in the Republican Party as they have essentially lost the country on policy. Not completely, but what I mean by that is if you look at public opinion on abortion, gay marriage, the uh, US's role around the world, climate change, taxation, using taxes to reduce the, the, the wealth gap to some degree. Increasingly, it's become more and more difficult for Republicans to win uh, uh, particularly national races on those issues. And so an extraordinarily simplistic assessment would be 
Now they tr just try to steal the elections because people aren't actually voting for them because they haven't. I mean, OK, they talk more about they don't talk that much about gay marriage anymore. They seem to have sort of accepted they've lost that one. T to what degree is losing on policy responsible for what we're seeing? Um, and arguments have been made by scholars smarter than I, uh, like uh, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, that there's a relationship between losing in policy and this sort of populist rhetoric. Mm. Um, as, a, as an alternative way to win or to mobilize, uh, broadly speaking, working class whites. Yes. Um, I think there's pretty good evidence that the, the move to movement starting really accelerating after 2010 to restrict access to the ballot box is, uh, is a product of that, um, as well as extreme gerrymandering in some states. But stealing elections, I think, is, I mean, that was in many respects an invention of Trump. It has since diffused, and it's very, very difficult to put that back in the, in the ballot. But I don't think there are any other major politicians in, the, in at least at the national level in the United States who would have done what Trump did in 2020, which is just outright reject and try to overturn the results of an election. So the Republicans were clearly playing dirty because they were having trouble winning. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, though, I mean, our institutions give them a crutch, right? The Republicans can win and exercise a lot of national power with 46, 47 percent of the national vote. The Electoral College, the Senate, the Supreme Court, which is a product of, uh, at least indirectly, the, the Electoral College and the Senate, all um, give the Republican Party an enormous amount of power, even though they rarely win national majorities anymore. So even though Republicans have been tempted to play dirty because they can't win, they're actually able to win without winning, at least to a degree. They can they can uh, double down on unpopular policies, be a 47 percent party and still win elections. Right. Uh, and we didn't even get to Electoral College, but we'll save that for for a different conversation. The book is Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point. We've been speaking with one of the book's authors, Stephen Levitsky. Really appreciate your time and insights today. Thanks for having me, David.